Yeah, I, I, you know, it's flipping the question. It's like, it, it, the, you know, the answer is like, not how do I stop? Why am I keep, why do I keep going? <laughs> And I think part of the, you know, flipping it on his head and this idea of doing less means you're doing more is this fallacy that if I worked 24 hours, seven days a week, I'm actually going to be able to, to do all the things I think I should be able to do. And the reality is, is that we're not designed to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and we're designed to rest. We're designed to pause. And what happens when we rest and we pause and we get off the hamster wheel, we're actually more efficient. And so when you take a day to hang out with your friends and to build those social connections that David talked about, your brain is still working out that problem set that you were, you were worried about. It's still working out in, in your subconscious, but you're giving your brain a break and you're giving your mental health a boost. And what you'll find, if you trust it, is that if you press pause, take the break, sleep, you're going to be more efficient in your waking hours. And what I, you know, I find that if I don't get enough sleep, I'm inefficient. It just takes longer to do the things that I should be able to do. And so the question is like, how do you, how do you not take a break? Nancy, can I interject for, for, for a moment? You, you mentioned before when we were prepping for this forum that you had a personal story about mm -hmm. when you were a, a, a new faculty member and you were going through um, you're going through tenure, which at the schools you've been to are, are quite harrowing experiences. Well, they're harrowing experiences everywhere, but where your they schools were, were, were very much harrowing. So could you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, I can. So I was a new assistant professor. I was at Duke University, and if you're going to get tenure, you've got to publish and publish and publish and collect data and publish, and you've got to teach your courses, and you've got to teach your courses really, really well. And so there's this tendency that, you know, I should always be writing something. I should always be doing something. And there's a culture in the school, in my department at that time, that, and I think it's true in many universities, it's like, you know, the, the haggard professor who has no time and complains and, you know, is eager for the end of the semester. And, and so there I was, you know, modeling this for, you know, myself. And, and I was like wishing the semester away. And oh my gosh, this is so much work to do. I can't sleep and I can't do this. And I found myself wishing away the semester. Like, oh my gosh, can't wait till it's over. And I had this epiphany that if I was going to wish the semester away, then I was going to end up wishing my life away one semester at a time. And the pathway I was on of trying to work seven days a week and not sleep, get up early, stay up late, write papers, collect data all the time. It wasn't sustainable from a physical or a mental health standpoint. And as a woman of faith, I thought, I'm going to try this. You know, they say, take a Sabbath. I'm going to try it. And I decided that I was going to work five days, work hard those five days. Fifth a day, do all the things you have to do to live, laundry, grocery shopping, all that sort of stuff. But I was going to take a Sabbath. I was going to take a day of rest and reflect and, you know, spiritually go to church. And, and, and I was going to sleep at night. I was going to sleep seven hours, seven and a half. And I find if I sleep seven and a half, I'll wake up. I don't need an alarm. I'll wake up. And then I'm a dreamer, which is how I ended up in psychology. So that extra 30 minutes in bed to get to eight hours, I get to contemplate what I was dreaming about. And you know what happens is in that 30 minutes, I'll wake up with sentences flowing in my head of, of a paper that I'm working on or an idea about a journal to submit a paper to it. So it's like letting my brain rest actually made it more creative. And as I, you know, talk to God about this, because I talk to God like he's a person, because in my world, he is a person. Um, when I talk to God, he's like, trust me on this. And what I found was for a 10-year stretch, every time I submitted a paper for publication, even to journals that reject 85% of the papers that you submit, I never had a rejection. For 10 years, every time I submitted a paper, no matter where I submitted it, it got accepted. And it was just like this faith statement, like, hey, Nancy, if, if you just do this my way, 
take the Sabbath, sleep at night, take a break. Your brain's going to work anyway, and you're going to be more efficient. You're going to be happier, and you're going to enjoy your work. You're going to enjoy your students because you're going to have time to enjoy your students because they can come in your office hours and you're not looking at the clock because you need to write the paper. You're like, I can write the paper. It's no problem. And so I had this period of time that had that stretch. And as I likened it is in our earlier conversation, Daniel in the Bible talked, he was supposed to eat all the King's meat and that was going to make him strong and, and a warrior as they were in exile in Babylon. And he decided he was in his relationship with God, he was going to be a vegetarian. Now I'm a vegetarian, but it has nothing to do with that. <laughs> it was this idea that, you know, could I be as strong if I'm not eating meat? And it was just his little secret with God that he could trust God, that even if he didn't do all the work and all of the stuff that he was supposed that everybody else said that he should do, if he just trusted God to press pause, to follow his way, that God was going to come through. And that's been true in my life in those days. And it's true in my life in other ways today. And I still sleep seven and a half hours, take a Sabbath, hang out with my kids, hang out with my husband. And try to have a full life. And that's how you live your whole life. It's a marathon, not a sprint. But that's how it's worked for me. David, what about yourself? Yeah, well, you know, Nancy, I identify with, um, yeah, the, certainly the, the power of sleep. And if there is ever any silver bullet in health and medicine, it is sleep. Sleep will, will cure m- most many things. Um, and like you with a, with a really consistent and healthy sleep schedule. I've not used an alarm clock in over 20 years. The body learns and takes care of itself. It knows what it needs to do. It's just, yeah. it's been fantastic. Um, yes. And, and I will, I will just, I will add to that from, from the, my perspective and what I've talked about already. Part of it is about figuring out the, the things that we do that really that, that are really important to us, that are part of our calling, that are part of our purpose, with with the hamster wheel mentality, we can just keep we can pile on all sorts of things, and sometimes we have a difficult time saying no and take on things that really are pretty far removed from what really is important to us. So I think it's that that is an essential process is to figure out really what is my core focus, what is my core value, what deserves really my 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 attention. And you know what you know you know when you're working on something that really matters to you at your core when the work doesn't feel like work. And when work doesn't feel like work, it's also it tends to be less stressful. Mm-hmm. You. You just, it's just, it becomes part of your existence. It becomes part of your um, living and breathing and it, it, it feels less like a chore. So the more of that you have on your plate, the, the less anxiety and, and the less exhaustion and burnout you're likely to feel. So th- there's the process of figuring out what am I doing that really matters? And what are those things that I'm not doing that matters? And I truly believe that in order to really have a meaningful conversation around that and to figure that out, we need other human beings to talk to about it. We need to get out of our own head. And this goes back to um, getting comfortable talking to other people and really asking for help, asking for help. So I'm overwhelmed. I've taken on too much. What I need to do is reach out to someone and be able to talk about it and sort through all of that. So I, to me, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get back to building that capacity for meaningful relationships, because that's going to be one, uh, one of the, the more effective tools to work through any kind of challenge that faces us, is being connected to other people and, 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 and forces and, and faith and other type and, 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 and purpose and initiatives and all of those things really getting connected and leaning on those those things for our own process. Mm 